Hello everyone and welcome to The Green Flame, the deep green resistance broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the revolutionary movement to defend the planet and rebuild just human communities. I am your host and comrade, Max Wilbert. High Speed 2, HS2, is a planned high-speed railway network in the United Kingdom with its first phase between London and Birmingham currently under construction. Like all large-scale industrial projects, it is incredibly destructive to the natural world. Only 2% of the UK's ancient woodlands remain and are home to many rare and threatened species. HS2 construction has already impacted or destroyed some of these ancient woodlands. 108 ancient woodlands, as well as other precious natural communities, could be impacted or destroyed by the project should it go forward. Environmental destruction is a big reason why activists are opposing HS2. They also include in their concerns the huge financial cost of HS2, the displacement of jobs, and the destruction of human communities by the project. Wherever you are in the world, chances are you are being impacted by a major infrastructure project like HS2. Some of the details shared in this interview may be unfamiliar to you, and then again, they may be hauntingly familiar. These projects are promoted as being necessary for the economy and even for sustainability, but these projects are incredibly, incredibly destructive to the natural world. They do not represent progress or advancement. They represent a path further into the human supremacist era, into the era of ecological collapse. We thank Dr. Larch Maxey for interviewing with us for the Green Fame and Kara for conducting the interview. Dr. Maxey has been heavily involved in the HS2 protests, including spending a month down a tunnel attempting to stop construction of the London HS2 station. He also spent time in prison in May of this year, 2021, for criminal damage of the HS2 head office. We thank Dr. Larch Maxey for sharing his understanding and knowledge of the HS2 project and the struggle to stop its destruction with our listeners. Many thanks in addition to Psychedelephant for permission to use their music on this episode of The Green Flame. We have included Care of the Guard and Dirty Tactics. <laughs> To the mind clutter, we divine for the line while we earn our bread and butter. Stuck in the rhythm of inhibition, just listen to the tales that they spin to distract your intuitions. Challenge your kind, searching your find. Morals refined, souls have been touched, are forever entwined. We feed the fire with the fuel we find. Precious flames need to be before the light can shine. Cook your puppets, guide our way. We're just pawns waiting to be played Better trust your eternal compass When deciphering the stars Cause you know where we're traveling Carry the gun Who's a soothsayer? Who's a truth? Just be sure to go and see the responsible bill Pay away while heroes and fools Observing the rules, electing the tools Lose and you lose, they won't walk in your shoes Using too many balls to take away our rights Justify their crimes, these are things they deny The budget's winning, the house is always winning While they feast upon the fruit, the bears are seeds of new beginnings Cook it up, it's kind of way We're just pawns waiting to be played Better trust your internal compass When deciphering the stars Cause you know where I'm traveling Carry the God Ooh, oh, 
consciousness Observing the press Neglect the issues they need to address We're making the time to declare our defiance We march now with purpose In deafening silence Crooked puppets guide our way The road is long to our dismay Better trust your internal compass With this apple in the sky I'm here with Larch Maxi, who works on HS2 Rebellion and Extinction Rebellion, among others. Thank you so much for giving up your time to talk to us today. We really appreciate it. Um, so I think it's really important to just talk about what HS2 is right now for the people who may not know, who might be listening from other countries. And um, do you want to do you want to give a definition or would you like me to kind sure. of say no, what I think? I'm happy to. Yeah, thank you. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for bringing me on the show. Um, yeah, so HS2 is it stands for high speed two. It's high speed railway in the UK. Uh, high speed one is the high speed train that goes the, the channel tunnel goes under the tunnel. High speed two is a sort of basically it's a vanity project that was devised about 13 years ago um, by the then Minister for Transport, Andrew Adonis, with a high speed rail lobbyist. The two of them in a closed room, the high speed lobbyist, Chris Steele, lobbied Andrew Adonis and said, you know what you need, Andrew, you need the world's fastest train. Andrew Adonis said, oh, that's a great idea. Well, imagine being the minister that brought about the world's fastest train. So that's and basically on the basis of that conversation, which had no scrutiny or anything. The whole thing has been sold as a done deal since that conversation took place. So any of these inconveniences like due process of law, supposed democracy, the fact that we're in a climate and ecological emergency, that you might want an environmental assessment and all of these other things. The fact that you might need to justify a business case, all of those things had to be, they were inconvenience. So they had to just be brushed aside or dealt with as, as, as tokenistically as possible in order that the done deal carried on. HS2 is a done deal. It's happening anyway. You might not like it, but it's happening. And so that's the basic context of, of HS2. In, in the process, because it was aimed to be the world's fastest train, they massively over-specified it. And so there's no justification for the UK having the world's fastest train because we're a small country. Um, we just don't have the volume of travel. Uh, the initial sort of business model, as much as there ever was one that we can kind of deduce, was that basically it was a way of trying to get the business elite, which kind of did exist back 13 years ago, of these global elite that want to travel around the world really quick. It was, an, it was to facilitate them getting between airports quickly. So that's effectively what HS2 originated as. It was it was linking up all the major airports in the UK. And, and so the airports have been chief lobbyists for HS2, and, and they still are. So that's the kind of context, really, for it. So it's proposed to be the world's most expensive train ever built mile per mile and has this massive carbon impact because it was aimed to be the world's fastest train. Now, like most things about HS2, it's it's never going to it's a failure. It's never going to deliver that. It's now they've recognised. Oh, it's never going to be the fastest train. But the spec for it is still way over spec. So the, the amount of concrete it's going to require, the amount of steel, the amount of land, all of these things are massive impact impacts because it was trying to be the world's fastest train. Back 13 years ago, there seemed to be an exponential growth in business travel. And so based on that, they said, oh, look, we can justify this. And of course, it would have fed that travel. We know from 40 or 50 years of uh, my, my master's thesis, I specialized in transport, European environmental policy and regulation. And I specialized in transport for my MSc. And we know from that, that, that research that you, you create this infrastructure and you, you generate demand. You, you know, we know it about roads, but it's also true about trains. So if HS2 had been built and we hadn't had COVID and we hadn't had the climate and ecological emergency, it may have encouraged more business travel. But we, we, all of those things are true. We, do, we are in a climate and ecological emergency. We, we know even the UK is committed to going zero carbon by 2050, which is way too late. That's a death sentence, according to the science. 
but HS2 fails to even meet that inadequate target because it would never be carbon neutral because of its massive carbon emissions, its massive uh, uh, concrete consumption, et cetera. So, yeah, the context of HS2 is that it's this vanity project never really justified on any sensible grounds. And meanwhile, the the UK is being burdened with this huge carbon debt and, and financial debt. And do you know what the what the route is proposed? I know that there's Birmingham to London because I'm very close to the Birmingham, the Birmingham side of it. Yeah. yeah how, sure. how far is it supposed to expand? It's supposed to go from London. Uh, so starting at Euston Station in London, in Camden, in London, uh, going up north towards Birmingham. But it doesn't go into Birmingham. It goes round. So they're building a new station outside of Birmingham on Curzon Street, outside the centre anyway. And then going up a bit north of Birmingham, it would fork and go head towards Manchester with uh, Section 2A. And Section 2B would fork off towards Leeds. And then... Um, and then it would be linked into the existing railway network go, going on, on to Glasgow. But it would stop in Manchester and Leeds. That, that's the proposal. And phase one, which is the effectively London to Birmingham section, has had work going on for about a year now. And phase 2A from just north of Birmingham to, to Manchester has also started recently. But phase 2B to Leeds... That, that hasn't had parliamentary approval yet. That hasn't had the parliamentary debates. Interestingly, last week, apparently the, the transport minister in the UK said, oh, the phase 2B is happening. And this is exactly what we've seen throughout HS2, as I've just said, right from that very first conversation with Chris Steele and, and Andrew Adonis in a closed room, no dem- democratic scrutiny, no expert scrutiny. It was a, a lobbyist with a minister, and that was it. Based, you know, and, and so it's a done deal. And so this is what Grant Shapps, the, the transport minister, is still trying to present, saying, oh, it's happening, 2B is happening, but there's been no democratic scrutiny. And the reason I emphasize that is because when my I and others are in front of a judge trying to explain the problems with HS2 and why we are taking this um, very considered, very conscientious, very peaceful and calm direct action to try and hold HS2 to account and indeed stop HS2 or bring forward the date at which it is inevitably stopped because I'll go into this in a minute, but I do think it will be cancelled at some point. But while we're trying to do TED action, the judge will come back often saying, oh, but it's it's a democratic uh, scheme. It's It's been through the due democratic process, but it really hasn't. And this is an example of it. 2B has not been into parliament, yet the minister's saying it's happening. So this is what we see time and time again. I feel like maybe this question you've already answered now, but um, see what you think. So why have you chosen to obstruct HS2's construction? Yeah, no, I don't think I've gone into that particularly. So so the important things. So I am a scientist. I spent 25 years in academia um, and, and, I've, and indeed for 10 years before that as a child. And then as a young, young man, I was um, very, very aware of the climate and ecological emergency and been active on that all my life, really. Um, and so as a scientist, I look around at the UK, look at all what's going on in the UK and think, what is the biggest impact right now on the climate and ecological emergency? And it's very clear it's HS2. It's the most ecocidal scheme, most damaging scheme the UK has ever done uh, in, in a single large infrastructure project. Indeed, it's the most destructive and largest scheme in Europe at the moment. So in terms of nature destruction and and exacerbating and accelerating the nature emergency it's the biggest scheme and it's also very significant in terms of the climate emergency and it's 14 million tons of carbon dioxide in the concrete and steel alone that's before you look at the land disturbance so when you like a lot of people don't realize that soil is a massive store of carbon so typically in a woodland the soil may store as much carbon as the trees to give you an example. So when you're disturbing this soil, and, and HS2 is a massive, massive scheme, the, the biggest, as I said, in Europe at the moment, then that, that's a huge additional burden of CO2 through released. Um, so when so the reason I've chosen HS2 to campaign on is because it's the single biggest scheme. So it's the single most destructive. And it's so when and, and, and the strategy we need is to stop the harm, 
to, to stop further emissions and stop more nature destruction and then start to carry out that repair work. For you know, We need both of them and it needs to come in the right order. There's no point trying to do the repair work if we're still spewing out CO2 emissions, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to stop the harm and then start the repair. So that's why HS2 and why direct action is because I, within my science studies, my academia work, I um, focused really on social change, the science of social change. So we've known for decades what the solutions are to the climate and ecological emergency. What we've lacked is the political will. How do you generate that political will? It's through a concerted campaign on many fronts um, and civil disobedience, nonviolent direct action is a vital key component to that campaigning, to effective change, to bring about change at the speed and scale that's required of the climate and ecological emergency requires that some people, not everyone, but some are willing to risk arrest and even some are willing to then take that further and, and keep keep pursuing direct action to the point of, of risking going to prison. And so that's why I am I'm taking that action. Again, it's based on the science, it's based on the evidence, based on the history. We know through hundreds of examples from the suffragettes, Gandhi, uh, the civil rights movement in America, the civil rights movement in uh, South Africa, where we ended apartheid, you know, all, all of these different movements, um, the, the, the anti-roads movement in the UK that I was very active in in the 90s. The anti-fracking movement has been more recent. You know, all of these movements have shown the, the power of nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience to bring about change, often reversing government policy. And so that's what's required now. We, so um, HS2 for me is an opportunity because it's so corrupt, because it's so wrong on every level. As soon as you, you know, I come from three generations of railway. My, my grandfather, my great grandfather and my great great grandfather worked all their lives on the railways. And so... I love trains. I love railways. It's in my blood. And my, you know, I, I was probably, a, you know, more predisposed towards HS2 more than, more than your average person because of that. Uh, but until I started scratching the surface and looking into it and thought, oh, this is the wrong kind of train development. Actually, HS2 is sucking money and resources and focus away from the genuine work we need on our railways. So, yeah, so that, that's why HS2 and why direct action against HS2. But it has to be as part of system change. HS2 is a great example of what's wrong with our system. The system that's given us the climate and ecological emergency, despite all the evidence over the last 40 and 50 years, we've accelerated the problem. And HS2 shows that it's the corruption, lack of democracy, lack of um, base, you know, lack of applying the science. And so... H most people in the UK oppose HS2 and, and, and the, the, the main challenge for the last 10 years of, of campaigning against HS2 has simply been information. And HS2 are relying on people not hearing about it. And if they do hear, they'll hear their mantra of it's happening anyway, whether you like it or not. So don't nothing to see here. Don't worry about it. We'll just get on and, and build this thing and then you'll see everything will be fine. Well, that's the same attitude the government's had. Uh, and everything isn't fine. We're in a climate and ecological emergency. We're heading towards societal collapse. So HS2, whether it be that you you love um, woodlands, you love trees, you love nature, you love wildlife, you love communities, you love ho housing, you love business, industry, you even love money. Whatever it is you love, you've got a reason to oppose HS2 because it's threatening all of those things and, and not justified on any of those grounds. So it's a way in for a lot of people to start questioning the system and that same system that, that created the climate ecological emergency and, and indeed many of the problems of society. So for me, it's an opportunity, a way in, a gateway drug, if you like, towards questioning climate change, uh, questioning the systems that created the problem. Excellent. Thank you. So much information. It's awesome. It's And it's bringing up loads of like memories for me as well. Like when um, when I remember they first proposed it and they're like, oh, we're going to consult. And then they, and then it didn't really seem like they did that properly. And then they were like, oh, we'll delay it. And then they just kind of snuck it in a little bit, didn't they? And then they exactly. just started doing it. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's what they've done all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. And it's weasel words. And so we've had numerous select committees, uh, om independent ombudsmen and, and, and various kind of independent you know world-renowned transport uh, infrastructure experts pretty much everyone remotely independent neutral balanced who has looked at this 
has criticised it and, and said, you know, so we've had select committees that have criticised it for misleading parliament, lack of transparency. I mean, you know, it's, it, it gets clearer and clearer that, you know, HS2 outright lie on, on numerous occasions. They've lied in court, they've lied to the media, they've lied to the public, they've not even lied to, to politicians and to parliament. So, you know, yeah, on, on every single ground you can imagine, HS2 doesn't stack up. Absolutely. So I think maybe that flows quite nicely into the uh, the reasons that they say and that you hear kind of Joe Bloggs on the street saying as to why they're building it um, yeah. and to talk about what your response to these things would be. Some things I've heard is faster journey times. I've heard that as a focus. Um, it creates jobs and uh, making the UK better connected and things like that. Yeah, um, right. I'm sure you can probably think of more and maybe yeah. what your response would be. Sure, sure, yeah. So they, 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 it's really great to break these down, identify them and break them down one by one. So, because um, none of them stand up to scrutiny. So if we take the first one, you just mentioned their time, journey time as well. As I said, um, you know, UK isn't a big country. Uh, journey times aren't on the scale we see in other countries and and so currently i think i think i mean the hs2's figures are changing all the time and we cannot trust them they're not reliable because like you said there they said oh we'll do a, we'll, we'll do a full rigorous consultation process and then they didn't they brushed it under the carpet and snuck it out you know through when no one was looking and the classic example of snuck, snucking it through when no one was looking was covid um during the first full-on lockdown in march 2020 having put off for years going for um like the like planning permission for a large infrastructure scheme like this in the uk is called notice to proceed so work had preparatory work had you know in quotations had carried been going on for years they'd, they'd failed and destroyed hundreds of trees hundreds of hedgerows albeit not obliterating woodlands yet but they'd done all that preparatory so-called preparatory work a massive destruction with no notice to proceed with no planning permission all of that work you know should not have happened um, so they've been under growing pressure for years to say, you know, what about this notice to proceed? Are you going to do it or not? Um, and then without any warning, they snuck it through in a really rushed process in March 2020, when everyone was panicking about the very first lockdown and about COVID, are we all going to die? And so that's a good example of how they kind of sneak these things through. So uh, let's address these issues that they raised. So first of all, time, their figures, as I said, we can't trust them, but this is you know, it's all we've got really is to take their figures. I think one, one, I mean, they have, they have varied, you hear different versions, but it's 28 minutes journey time saving between Euston and Birmingham. So that's what they claim. Now, if you break that down, um, e e even in disrespect of some of you, oh, well, I don't need a faster train, what's the point? Um, and, th and there's a bigger issue, actually, of um, what's useful time. So, you know, the current journey from London to Birmingham is about perfect time to jump on the train, settle in, get a drink, and then do a bit of work before you've got to pack your kit up and get off again. If you reduce that time, you haven't really got time to do any work. Now, HS2 have justified, like they've, they've twisted the figures constantly. And I can give you a number of examples, but here's one. Here's a classic one. So in order to justify the whole scheme, they say every second spent on a train is wasted time because no one ever gets a laptop out on a train. No one ever does work on a train. No one ever has a, has a business call or chat on a train. Every second is wasted. So in order, because then they say if they save any of those seconds, they've saved money. Um, and, and so they start to try and justify the incredible outlandish cost of HS2. There's so much we could do digitally with the technology we've got now without any destroying trees or any concrete, you know, just by improving the existing infrastructure and the, and the, 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 the way you mesh between those different services. That's where the savings are to be made. And that's what we should be focusing on, amongst other things. So independent experts have already looked at this and gone, this is where we go. And so that's why a, a genuine assessment of this whole area would not come up with HS2. You'd come up with all these other more significant, beneficial and, and much, much cheaper and quicker solutions that are already available if we choose to go down that route. Yeah, so time saving, much better ways to save time, much better ways to use our time. Uh, it's, it's a bogus, a bogus kind of argument. Jobs equally spurious. So um, the government launched the sort of official, we're going for HS2 um, with this claim that it's creating, I think, 20 or 22,000 jobs. Now, those 22,000 jobs 
are um, mostly temporary because it's in the construction, the construction of HS2. Um, and what they don't say is that it's actually threatening 19 and a half thousand jobs. Um, many of those are permanent jobs. So in, in the, in, you know, it's costing 230 billion pounds. And that figure is going up all the time. Now, that figure is the most reliable one we've got at the moment. Uh, it's by Tony Barkley, who's a world expert on, on transport infrastructure and includes rolling stock. He was the, the deputy chair of the in, supposedly independent um, review of HS2. So we never, because of that, the way HS2 came about through these two guys in a room having a conversation going, it's happening now. There was never a proper assessment of HS2, never a strategic assessment of the whole infrastructure piece in the UK and, and where we need work and we don't. The first semblance of an attempt at that was the Oakley review. So when Boris Johnson came into power, he's like, oh, not sure about HS2, we better assess it. Now he handpicked Douglas Oakley, who was the CEO of HS2, to be the chair of that independent review so he was he picked someone who's going to basically say yeah hs2 is a good thing because I, I used to run it of course i'm going to say yes but the mistake they made was putting tony barkley as the deputy chair because tony barkley is independent is is knows his stuff and so his his assessment at the moment is 230 billion and that's the best estimate we've got at the moment hs2 is saying it's 106 billion but that figure is going to go up and it goes up all the time but that's just their manipulation of the figures anyway you, you, it's the most expensive job creation scheme in history. You know, like if you invested a fraction of that into healthcare and education, um, energy efficiency, um, rewilding, you know, all of these things, these areas that are so essential, create jobs at a far more effective way. You could also invest in the, the, the legitimate ways of improving our train network, like electrification and the digital railways stuff that I've just been talking about. Um, and so with that 230 billion, you could you could do all of that. You know, you, you know, you wouldn't do all of the HS, uh, the NHS costs, but you could put some of it into that and you would create many, many times, tens of times more jobs than you create through putting it into HS2. Because HS2 is a cost heavy, infrastructure heavy project. You're putting a lot of money in, into to, to concrete, whereas if you, you could get a lot more benefit by putting it into service based stuff. Um, so, so in terms of jobs, it doesn't stack up. It's destroying thousands of jobs. And most people don't realize that. 19,500 jobs, many of them permanent. So the jobs thing does not stack up. There's much better ways of creating jobs. There's something called the um, costs plus scam within HS2. So as you stand up against HS2, you suddenly get all of these whistleblowers coming to you. These people saying, I, I can't go public with this because I'll lose my job. You know, HS2 is the most oppressive, bullying business there is in the uk at the moment is it's got the uni uh, the high the record for the number of gagging orders it's a public scheme public money going into it yet there's like hundreds of companies that have had to sign gagging orders before they can get on the, on the road but despite that you get people coming through saying oh yeah this is the scam so one one example of this scam is the cost plus scam so whereas you might normally charge a thousand pounds a day for a bit of plant to be hired out if it's hs2 you charge it at three thousand pounds if you if it's a it's a person working on a scheme normally it'd be 100 pounds a day you, you charge 300 pounds a day for hs2 this is what's happening across the board this is another reason why hs2 is so expensive so it's absolutely not a job creation scheme it's a scam brilliant thank you i uh i heard somebody saying the other day as a really good response to this that it's a real non-argument because you could employ people to just put skyscrapers and infrastructures all over all our woodland, all our wildlife and create jobs. But it's not really what we want to see happen. Nobody wants to see that happen, do they? It's kind of at what nature sacrifice do we exactly. create a job? Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it's such good propaganda, isn't it, to focus on jobs generated and completely forget to mention the amount of jobs lost. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What was the next one you said? Uh, making the UK better connected. Connected. That was it. That's the an emotional, visual yeah. sort of thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So that was something that's been argued for and, and they're still trying to cling to. So the idea of leveling up as the phrase that Boris Johnson likes to use. So there's a genuine need for that in the UK, but this levelling up agenda, you know, <laughs> do you really trust the, like under the Tories, uh, the gap 
between, I mean, to be fair to the Tories, it happened under Labour, the Labour, previous Labour governments too. That, but, but, you know, the gap between the rich and the poor is increasing. The um, elite, the top 1% or increasingly the top 0.1%, they are concentrating wealth more and more. You know, we've during the pandemic, the number of billionaires in the UK has reached record levels. And it's those people that benefit from HS2, not the country as a whole. This idea that it's leveling up agenda is absolutely ungrounded, untrue. For example, until like every poll since since the cost jumped from 30 odd billion to 56 billion, every poll which is now obviously a long time ago because the costs have skyrocketed to well over 100 billion now. Um, but every poll that's been taken on HS2 has opposed it. Came out most people, more people oppose it than a favour of it. And then actually a lot of people don't know because there's just not been enough information about it. Just like me, before I scratched the surface and took the time to look into it, I thought, well, it, it must be a good thing. Um, but actually, you know, despite that lack of information, most people oppose it. I, I would say it's it's getting to the point where it's, becoming the most unpopular scheme in the UK. And even right from the start, even when, before it got that clear, the North, the further you got from London, the greater the opposition to HS2. Because people can see through the bullshit, if you'll excuse my language. People can see through it. So people in Leeds knew that it wasn't going to be benefiting Leeds. That's why they've been so strongly opposed it. They're sharp northerners. They, they're used to the bullshit from, from London and from the, the central government. And so if you genuinely wanted to benefit the north, you would do things like what Tony Barclay and independent experts have said, which is invest in joining the dots, joining the northern cities, invest in those connections. It will cost you a lot. One, one, one assessment that, that he quotes on his website is, I think it's something like 43 billion to do the whole of the railway network in the UK, electrify it, join up the dots between the northern cities. So actually investing, improving where it's necessary. You know, all of that work could be done genuinely leveling up for a lot less than the 230 billion and climbing that HS2 is about. So just like HS2 isn't about saving time or creating jobs, it's not about leveling up. It will concentrate wealth to the 0.1% it will further concentrate wealth in London. So an example of that is, is the French high-speed, there's different ways of doing a high-speed railway. Broadly, there are two. There's a spokes model and a, and a kind of hub, multiple hub model. The, the spoke model is where you have a central hub and the spokes feed into it. And that was the, the French model. And although the French model um, in some ways has been successful and it's made money, and usually most, most high-speed uh, railway don't, they, they continue at a loss forever. Um, but it has concentrated wealth further in Paris and it has sucked it from the regions. The, the other model, German model, has been a better. It's got a, a number of cities which are more equally served by high speed rail. But you know, our model isn't that. It's the French model. It's the concentrate the wealth in London. So we know from it, history, we know from the design of it what HS2 is about. It's about sucking wealth further into London. It's about allowing people the commuter belt of London to expand so it'll push property prices up and make people less able to afford it. It'll further the distance between the rich and the poor. That's the agenda HS2 feeds. It's not a genuine level in the uh, agenda. Um, so those are the three you gave. The other uh, arguments the HS2 give is that it's green. It's a, it's a green tra transport mode. And so they often, and this is one of the, my kind of most pet peeves, if you like, with, with, I do, you know, you do an action, you put yourself on the line, you make this sacrifice of volunteering your time, risking your liberty, sacrificing your income and all of the things we do. You do an action, you get the coverage. And then the coverage is this supposed balanced covering with coverage, which means they, they give someone, some unaccountable spokesperson from HS2, doesn't give their name or anything. They come up with the same pet quote after every interview or every you know time that they, they get reported, uh, and, and it's the real lack of due diligence in the media where they they don't fact check what HS2 say; they just report it. So HS2 will say things like, "Oh, those naughty protesters! They shouldn't be causing trouble. Um, they should be helping us do the important work of modal shift, getting people out of planes, out of um, off the roads, and onto trains." And that doesn't stand up. HS2's own figures, the Department of Transport's own figures say there'll be a modal shift of 1% from planes onto HS2 
and 3% from roads under HS2. That is not a legitimate modal shift, yet that gets reported the way that HS2 quoted without any comeback. And this is something I constantly raise with the media, with the journalists, you know, like, oh yeah, you want, you know, like when I was down the tunnel, had all the media on me going, oh yeah, well, you know, can you, and so I would really try and get them saying, yeah, we'll do this for you. We'll give, you know, we'll, it was a lot of work to kind of do interviews down the tunnel because um, you had to move around. It was really, you know, anyway, I won't go into the deals, but it was really hard. But I was willing to do that, obviously, to get the issue out there. And the journalists would promise the earth. Once they got the interview, though, they just did their usual business as usual reporting. So it doesn't take a lot. It's what journalists are supposed to do. They're supposed to fact check. They're only supposed to report the truth, but they don't. They report HS2's kind of um, bullshit, unfortunately. And, and so, yeah, there is no genuine modal shift. It's, it's what, as I said, the design of HS2 is about facilitating aviation. It's about getting people between airports quickly. Um, and so it's, it's even on those grounds, it wouldn't be, be um, a positive thing for the world. With, once you start looking into this carbon CO2 emissions, 40 million tonnes because of the concrete and all of the other costs. And of course, we have to mention the 108 ancient woodlands. That's the independent research from the Woodland Trust who are massively opposed HS2, all of the environmental NGOs in the UK that are even remotely kind of neutral, look at this and go, this is a disaster, and so oppose it. The thing that got me questioning it was when I saw that the Green Party were opposing it, because I was in favour of it, because it was a train. And then I started thought, well, why would the Green Party oppose it? And the reason the Green Party oppose it is because they're actually doing the honourable thing of looking at the science, looking at the facts. And interestingly, there are a few... Green Party members now that are saying Greens for HS2. And I would love to speak with them. I would love to kind of work with them, say, look, why, why do you think it's a good idea? Because it really doesn't stack up all of the research. When you look at all of the, the full picture in a balanced way, it doesn't stack up on, on any grounds. Thank you. I'm thinking as well of the uh, memorial uh, site that they've recently dug up. That yeah. was uh, quite a low blow as well, wasn't it? Absolutely. It just shows the, um, well, that, that is typical of HS2, I promise you. So that for, for people that don't know, there was um, a, a children's memorial sem- garden cemetery where, where people that have died in, 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 you know, very, very, very young ages. You know, I, I, if anyone's got any awareness of this, I, I had a cousin that died very young and I know how difficult it was for my auntie and uncle to deal with that. So I have that experience. Anyone that loses a child at such a young age, it's a particularly painful thing. And many times the parents never fully get over it. You know, it's always going to be a deep pain that's there for them. And this memorial garden was was still very active. And so parents were going there to to grieve their, their, you know, their young children. And HS2 very, very insensitively just came in and, 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 and trashed the thing. With no proper warning and, and process to, to engagement with the charity or with the parents who are doing it. And that's been their attitude all the way through that, you know, we, we've had landowners, farmers, people that have been brought up in their farm, farmed all their life, having heart attacks because of the stress that HS2 have put them over the insensitive way. They just send the bailiffs in and get them moved on. It's absolutely shocking the way HS2 treat people. We're seeing it now in Camden with people suffering all hours of the day and night through the work. They haven't, HS2, haven't met, kept their promises of insul- soundproofing, providing ventilation and doing the, the, the necessary work before they carry on their, their disruptive work. And this is happening time and time again across the board, the way HS2 are treating people. Um, it's like they're a law unto themselves and that's the way they're behaving. Uh, someone has described them as the biggest gangsters in the UK. Um, that's that's there, uh, you know, and I can understand why they would form that view based on their behaviour. I'm wary of the time. Uh, yeah. But do you want to finish off with uh, your call to action? What yeah. what you'd like people to do so that we can support you? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So um, I think the, the there's two parts to what I would really invite people to do. The first most essential part is that we tell the truth. Sounds really easy. Who wouldn't who's not in favour of the truth? But to actually tell the truth fully right now in this place we find ourselves in humanity at this stage of humanity is the most challenging thing we can do. So it's not something that I take lightly and I recognize that it's deeply challenging. But that is the challenge we have before us to tell the truth, to let the truth in of how 
disastrous our current predicament is. We are in a climate and ecological emergency. Telling the truth means letting that in. It means facing the emotional turmoil that that will bring us. Bring us. Um, it doesn't mean a tokenistic exercise like the UK government has tried to do, where it declared an emergency in 2019. has done nothing substantive about it, but pushed ahead with things like HS2, which are accelerating it. It's the opposite of that. It means telling the truth that we are in an existential crisis. If we, the science says, if we carry on with emission, we, well, we're already in the danger zone. There's already too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The last time there was this much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the planet was three or four degrees warmer than it is now. The reason we haven't got that level of warming already, we're, we're at 1.1 degree already above pre-industrial levels, but the reason it's not more is because of global dimming, which when we burn the invisible fossil fuels, we, we suppress the atmosphere with these particulates that, 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 that shelter the planet. So that you know, suppresses the, the heat by about half a degree um, and climate lag. So the emissions that we did 20 years ago are the ones that are generating the heat now, which give us 1.1. The emissions we've done today and yesterday and, and, and since those last 20 years are yet to kick in. So th those two factors alone show how serious it is. You know, the safe level is 350 parts per million. We're at 420 parts per million and climbing. We're in the danger zone. The science says we're heading towards societal collapse. This is the truth that I invite everyone listening to this to face. And that is a daily practice, because if we don't actively try and tell the truth every day, the rest of the in like society's inertia and business as usual will creep in and that will be our predominant disposition everything's okay it's not that serious really because that's the messaging we get from the rest of the world but when we pay attention to the science we see that it's the most important issue whatever it is you love whatever it is you care about we have to address this emergency otherwise it's all going to be destroyed that's the reality so once we start that pro it's not a tick box you cannot just tell the truth and then move on it's like it's a daily practice of informing yourself reminding yourself like for me i bring to mind every day uh, the, the 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 pain that, that that is causing you know 100 to 200 species will go extinct today because of the way we're treating because of this crisis and that those numbers are accelerating a thousand children and more will die today because of climate change and those numbers are accelerating billions of people are going to die if we do not drastically change things work out how to stop emissions get that co2 back down to 350 and below the biggest challenge humanity's ever faced we probably well we possibly can do it we don't know but we have to try so that's the biggest challenge tell the truth and from that place then act because only when we really tell the truth will we start to act appropriately and for me, that has meant giving up my job that I've spent my life creating. It's meant, you know, sacrificing my family life. It's meant times in, in prison and, you know, in the police, police cell. But none of that um, comes close to yet to addressing the crisis. But we know from the social science that when people are really willing to make those, that level of sacrifice, we get the change that's needed. So all we need is enough people telling the truth and willing to act on it sufficiently. And it doesn't mean everyone going to prison it means enough of us doing that, that that we bring about the change you know we could bring that change about by you know a hundred thousand people lobbying their politician so so concertedly that, that we get the change that way it's possible but it could be that we get you know tens of thousands of people on the streets in london in, in august it could be that we get thousands doing arrestable action there's many different ways and Ways people can act is up to you, your creativity. What And I would say that, so to f tell the truth and then act from that place. And when you're acting from that place, do what you love to do. Do what is, is your calling. Do your passion. If you're an artist, use your art to tell the truth, to bring it to more people, to spread the word. If you write, then write. If you sing, sing. Whatever it is you love to do. And we do need mathematicians, people that are good at maths to help with the finances. We do need and write business plans and put in funding applications. There's many, many things people can do. It could be that you make a donation, like the cost of a coffee a month as an ongoing donation. Many, many things we can do. And I wouldn't say any of us should just do one. It's like 
our progressive process. The more we tell the truth, the more we can step up, step up and, and take action accordingly. HS2 Rebellion, the website's got a load of examples of actions of great ways in for people to, to take action. Now that I'm currently on tag, I, um, I'm banned from going within 100 metres of a HS2 site. And I've been saying for years, it doesn't matter what that action is. What we really need is people to help coordinate, people to give up their time, and help organise. And so that's what I'm now doing. And so all of us can do something, whatever it is, whether we're arrestable or not, whether we're, you know, wherever we are on, on any kind of spectrum of, of actions and, and levels of risk and levels of sacrifice, whatever it is, where we are, we're on, we're all on a journey of telling the truth. Wherever we are on that journey, we can all act according to that and support ourselves and each other for optimally contributing to this movement that's the key to support ourselves and each other to optimally contribute to this movement when we can get enough of us doing that the change will happen brilliant yeah. well thank great. you so much it's oh, been really pleasure. great to meet you thank you yeah and you
This is Max Wilbert, one of the hosts of the Green Flame podcast. I want to thank you for listening to our show and let you know a few ways that you can support the Green Flame. First, you can subscribe to our platform using the podcasting system of your choice. We're listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pocket Cast, and all the rest. We're even on YouTube. Leaving us a positive review or rating on these platforms helps us reach a larger audience. You can also share these shows with your friends. If you're interested in donating to support the production of The Green Flame, please visit deepgreenresistance.org. And finally, the goal of this show is to activate people. So if you really want to support this show, start organizing in your own community. Thank you again for listening.